Welcome to our service here at Holy Trinity Red Hill. My name is Dave Aaron Smith. I'm the family and children's minister here. As we come to worship God, let's spend a few moments in quiet to reflect on our week. Lord, thank you for your provision for us. Speak to us through our time of worship to you. Guide us through your word, refreshing our minds and souls. Amen. Join me now as we begin our service by singing our first song. over the last week have there been any times when we have forgotten God or not looked to him to help us have we tried to live in our own strength and use our own wisdom rather than looking to him let's be quiet for a moment and ask God to put his finger on one or two areas of our lives that we need his forgiveness for. Heavenly Father, we so easily forget you. We forget your love for us. We forget that you are always with us. We forget to involve you in the decisions we make. Please forgive us and help us to live for you day by day in every area of our lives. Amen. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty There's nothing my God cannot do That's true! My God is so big, so strong and so mighty There's nothing my God cannot do That's true, the mountains are His 
So strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. That's true, my God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. That's true, my God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. That's true, the mountains are peace, the valleys are peace. The stars are his happy word too My God is so big So strong and so mighty There's nothing my God cannot do That's true Today's reading is from Mark chapter 6 Beginning to read at verse 45 Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. After leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. Later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake and he was alone on land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them, walking on the lake he was about to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out, because they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately he spoke to them and said, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them, and the wind died down. They were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. When they had crossed over, they landed at Jersanarat and anchored there. As soon as they got out of the boat, people recognised Jesus and they ran throughout that whole region, carrying the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages, towns or countryside, they placed the sick in the marketplaces. They begged him to let them touch even the edge of his cloak, and all who touched it were healed. There are times when life can be extremely tough and challenging for us all. In my own family life, we just lived through a period where my mother-in-law, Molly, deteriorated quite rapidly, mentally and physically, and sadly she died in August. She hadn't coped at all well with the restrictions brought in because of COVID and the resulting isolation. And I know that our family isn't alone in going through challenging times. In fact, I'm acutely aware that there are many people in our church family at the moment who are struggling for all sorts of reasons, such as the loss of a loved one, redundancy, cancer treatment, the long-term effects of, of COVID, depression, anxiety, and many more reasons. And we sometimes talk about these kinds of struggles in terms of the storms of life or living through a dark time. Well, today we're going to look at a wonderful passage from Mark's Gospel in which the disciples were actually out in a boat in a storm in the darkness of night. And Jesus went out to be with them. It's a Bible passage that can give us real comfort and encouragement, especially in those difficult and dark times. So do have your Bibles open. It's Mark 6, 45 to 56. And the first thing to notice is the very first word in the passage, which is immediately. That should prompt us to look at what comes immediately before, which is the feeding of the 5,000. You'll remember we heard about that last week, uh, that an amazing miracle that Jesus took a small packed lunch of bread and fish and turned it into enough food to feed 5,000 men. And that wasn't including the women and children. Prior to that, Jesus had raised back to life a, a little girl and healed a woman who had chronic illness for 12 years. 
and we should keep in mind that this passage comes in the first half of Mark's Gospel which is all about who Jesus truly is the identity of Christ right at the very start I want to suggest we keep in mind two questions as we look through this passage they are what can we learn about Jesus and what can we learn from the experience of the disciples so let's look at the beginning of this passage it's Mark 6 45 to 48 immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd after leaving them he went up on a mountainside to pray later that night the boat was in the middle of the lake and he was alone on land he saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them after the feeding of the 5,000 Jesus told the disciples to take the boat and go on ahead of him across the lake that's known as the Sea of Galilee to Bethsaida that in itself was an act of selfless love he sent them off to give them a break from the noise and the pressure of the crowd and he dismissed the crowd himself then Jesus went up on the mountainside to pray clearly he had a real desire to spend time alone with God the Father in prayer and the Gospels tell us he often did that now we're not told what Jesus prayed about but it's quite likely that during that time he would have prayed for the disciples we know he cared about them deeply and that he prayed for them just before he went to the cross and here we're told that during the night Jesus looked up and saw the disciples straining at the oars struggling to row against a really strong headwind violent storms and strong winds are actually very common on the sea, at Gal sea of Galilee now it's unlikely that the disciples would have been praying for themselves at that time they were fully occupied in the exhausting task of, of rowing across the lake and it reminds me of the fact that sometimes when we're going through difficult dark times it's extremely hard to pray for ourselves we may only be able to cry out and say Jesus help me and at those times it can be really helpful to know that someone else is praying for us and that Jesus himself is praying for us Romans 8 34 reminds us that Jesus is now at the right hand of God the Father interceding for us for me that thought's a great comfort particularly at times when I can't articulate my own prayers let's go on now to the second part of verse 48 and read to verse 50 and notice that these verses actually reveal something profound about the nature of, of Jesus shortly before dawn he went out to them walking on the lake he was about to pass by them but when they saw him walking on the lake they thought he was a ghost they cried out because they all saw him and were terrified so just before dawn while it was still dark Jesus decided to go out to them walking on the water now let's be clear he wasn't paddling in shallow water or walking on a sandbank or anything like that he was actually walking on the water he was doing something miraculous and supernatural that shows his paranormal authority over the natural world the gospel account then says he was about to pass by them I think that's a really interesting detail that begs the question why would he go out to them with the intention of passing by and not intend to directly join them in the boat I want to suggest the answer is that it wasn't his intention to rescue them on this occasion but to reveal his divine nature to show them that he is God 
And this description of Jesus passing by has definite parallels in the Old Testament. So there's an occasion in Exodus 33 where Moses was called to lead the people and he felt completely inadequate and isolated. God came to him at that time and passed by, allowing Moses to glimpse the glory of God. There's a similar incident in 1 Kings 19. Elijah had a real mountaintop experience at Mount Carmel. And then afterwards, he was very afraid that he would be killed and he ran for his life. And God met with him and said, go stand on the mountain for the Lord is about to pass by. And then there was an earthquake wind and fire but God wasn't in any of that God's presence was in a gentle whisper as the Lord passed by there's still another example in Job 9 where Job was suffering and his friends frankly weren't any help at all uh, but Job reminded himself that God is powerful he says that God himself treads on the waves of the sea and passes by. So what's clear from these examples is that God does this passing by when his people need him most, when they're alone, afraid and struggling. And that was precisely what Jesus, the Son of God, was doing when he went out to the disciples walking on the water. But if we look at the response of the disciples, verse 51 says that they were terrified, scared out of their wits because they thought Jesus was a ghost. They really didn't get it. They were confused. They couldn't comprehend that this was really Jesus walking on the water. So even with, though, though they'd been with Jesus all the time, they'd seen him heal people and do miraculous things, they still hadn't understood that Jesus could do all this because he is God. Perhaps they hadn't had time to ponder and to process it all. And that should perhaps encourage us to ponder on the truth of who Jesus really is. We sometimes sing the song, Who is this man? He's the King of Kings, he's the Lord of Lords, he can heal the sick, he can calm the storm. Maybe you're thinking that's just a, a kid's song, but if you think about it, those words are actually very profound. And we perhaps should take time to grapple with the reality that Jesus was both fully human and fully God. You might want to just ponder that one. If we move on to verse 50, which told that Jesus saw that the disciples were terrified and he responded not only with his physical presence, but also with his words. Immediately he spoke to them and said, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. What amazing words of comfort and encouragement. If you're going through a tough time yourself or you know someone that is, let those words really speak to you this morning. Take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. My own response is to try and commit those words to, mem to memory so that I can bring them to mind when I need them. And that promise that Jesus is always with us runs through the whole Bible. So Matthew 28, 20 says, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And in the Old Testament, God says this in Joshua 1, 9, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So we can be assured that God will be with us always, throughout our lives, wherever we go and whatever happens. 
If you took part in the vision meeting last Sunday, you will have seen a superb interview with Brian and Claire Tate, where they were open and honest about their recent struggles. Claire's still suffering from the chronic condition known as long COVID after having the virus six months ago. And if that wasn't enough to cope with, they were flooded in the whole of the downstairs of their house uh, a few weeks ago. But it's, it was wonderful to hear Brian say that throughout all this, he's known that God has been with them as a family consistently. He's been able to hang on to that promise that God is with us all the time. And Brian and Claire have been able to experience uh, God's presence in a practical way through the love and care of the Holy Trinity Church family. That's a wonderful testimony, isn't it? Let's go back now to where we were in the story in Mark 6, verses 51 to 52 say this. Then he, Jesus, climbed into the boat with them and the wind died down. The disciples were completely amazed for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. After Jesus had spoken those words of encouragement, he climbed into the boat with them and the wind suddenly died down. Again, that was a supernatural, miraculous thing, showing that Jesus has total power over the natural world. And we can draw the analogy here that when we go through difficult and scary situations, Jesus is with us. In effect, he's right there with us in our boat. But we need to be a bit careful with this analogy because in the Bible account, as soon as Jesus got into the boat, the wind and presumably the waves died down. But that isn't necessarily our experience in real life. Quite often, Jesus doesn't just make all our problems disappear instantly, but we can know that his presence is with us always to help us and to strengthen us. And it's his presence that makes all the difference. But what about that verse that says that the disciples' hearts were hardened and they didn't understand about the loaves? What does that mean? It must surely mean that the disciples were there at the feeding of the 5,000. They'd been eyewitnesses to the fact that Jesus had transformed a few loaves and a couple of fish into food enough for 5,000 people, and yet they hadn't got it. They hadn't grasped the implication that Jesus is God, and they hadn't grasped it when he walked onto the water and he calmed the wind and the waves. In fact, they didn't really understand it fully until after the resurrection. And that phrase, their hearts were hardened, is also a, an interesting one. Of course, in the Bible, that word heart doesn't mean the organ that pumps blood round our bodies. It means our inmost being, the centre of our wills and emotions. So the phrase, their hearts were hardened, means the disciples' hearts were unreceptive, closed to the amazing spiritual truth that Jesus is God. And that thought makes me think that we should give ourselves a, a regular heart check. Anyone with a physical heart problem needs, knows they need to go and see their cardiac specialist regularly to get their heart checked out. And in the same way, I want to suggest that we need to come to God on a regular basis with openness and transparency so that he can examine our hearts in a spiritual sense and make us aware of any hardness of heart. Proverbs 28, 14 said this, Blessed is the one who always trembles before God, but whoever hardens their heart falls into trouble. So what can we take away from this very rich passage of scripture that we've looked at this morning in terms of practical application? I want to suggest two things in particular, and they're linked to the questions I posed at the very beginning. 
what can we learn about Jesus and what can we learn from the experience of the disciples? Well, I want to encourage you to ponder and to pray. Firstly, I want to suggest it'd be good to ponder on the Bible truths of who Jesus really is, that he is God, and let that truth increase and deepen our faith. The disciples failed to grasp that truth fully till after the resurrection, but we have the whole Bible at our fingertips. You could perhaps read the whole of Mark 5 and 6 and think about what it reveals about the identity of Christ and let that understanding sink down into your mind and heart. Secondly, we can pray into the storm. If we're going through a difficult, challenging time ourselves or, or we know someone who's struggling in some way, we can bring that to God in prayer and it doesn't matter if we don't really know how to pray about it just to say Jesus help me is all we need and we can know that his loving presence is with us even though we may not be able to feel it in any tangible way we can simply hold on to those wonderful words of comfort and encouragement from Jesus take courage it is I don't be afraid and we can hang on to that promise of Jesus. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So to finish, I want to encourage you to take some time this week to ponder and to pray. Let's pray now. Father God, may we know your loving presence with us now. Give us a greater understanding of who Jesus is. Increase our faith and our trust in him. And we pray for ourselves and those we love. For all who are going through difficult times, may we hear your voice saying, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Amen.
Justice has been satisfied. He will hold me fast. Raise with him to endless life. He will hold me fast till our faith is turned to sight. When he comes and Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you saw the disciples in their difficulties and came out to them over the water. They would perhaps have been longing for you and so wishing that you were in the boat with them, but because you came to them in an unexpected way, they were frightened and they didn't know who you were. Lord Jesus, help us to recognize you and welcome your presence, however you may choose to answer our prayers and the longings of our hearts. Help us to believe and act on that promise of Jesus, that he is always with us and listening to our prayers. Help us, Lord, in whatever situation we find ourselves, to come to you and to ask for help, and then to have the eyes to see you and the hearts to accept the help offered. As we bring our prayer for others to you now, Father, we ask you to help us bring to mind those people who right now need our prayers. After each section, please can you respond to the words, Lord, in your mercy, with the words, hear our prayer. Firstly, let us think of those in leadership in any sphere, local or national. People having to make decisions about how to maintain public safety in different places. Decisions with many implications and consequences. So let's, in a moment's quiet, name the people we perhaps know of locally and the people we have heard of nationally who need uh, God's help and guidance at this time. Father God, give gifts of discernment and courage to our leaders. May they take decisions that are for the good of all. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Also, Father, we pray as we enter the autumn and winter and the nights grow longer, we ask for grace and perseverance that the church may be faithful to its mission to show and share Jesus, who is the light of the world. Christmas isn't far off. So, Lord, help us to take every opportunity you give us to be light and to share the good news of your amazing and unending love for each and every person. Thank you that we see it so clearly in your gift to us of Jesus, which is remembered by everyone at Christmas. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lastly, Father, 
Help us now to pray for those we know who are in difficulties, whether financial, whether emotional pain or physical illness. Let us name them in the quiet of our hearts and ask God to meet their deep needs in a moment of silence. Come Holy Spirit and heal those we have named before you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. Hasten, Lord, the day when people will come from east and west, from north and south, and sit at the table in your kingdom, and we shall see your Son in his glory. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. having you with us today. If you'd like to join us at our Zoom virtual coffee time together, just 
check up after the service with the slides and you'll see the contact address to find all the details. Let's close our service, saying the grace together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Have a wonderful week and we will see you same time, same place next week.
see 